here. I'm a faculty member here at Civil and Environmental Engineering. We're very pleased today to have Smith Siramasco today to present on the diverging diamonds. Hi there. Um, well, first and foremost, I'd like to ask a question. How many of you in this room have actually heard of a diverging diamond interchange or know what it is? A scattering of you? And how much exactly have you heard? Just a little? Know what the concept is? That's about it? Does it sound to you guys like a good idea, bad idea? Just another idea? All right, fair enough. Usually I encounter groups that have one very firm opinion one way or another. And the reason for that is usually the first thing that you hear about diverging diamond interchanges is isn't that the thing where you drive on the wrong side of the road? And that's usually the end of the discussion. And what I'm here to do uh, today is to give you guys basically a rundown of the frequently asked questions that I've heard. And just to give you an idea what the, the presentation is going to cover today, uh, basically I'm going to give you a brief review of the actual concept. What is a diverging diamond interchange? I'm going to answer from frequently asked questions. Where did these frequently asked questions come from? Well, originally, way back when, um, I was involved in pushing for the state of Oregon to build their first DDI down in uh, southern, southern Oregon, down at Ashland, exit 14 on I-5. And as part of that process, we had to do a lot of selling of the concept. We had to sell it to the technical staff. We had to sell it to the executive staff. We've given this, I've given a form of the DDI presentation probably close to 60 times. And in those conversations, in those presentations, I've heard a lot of questions. A lot of those were repeated. And a lot of those repeated questions I've rolled into this presentation. So during the course of this presentation, if you have any questions whatsoever, fire away. Don't hold them to the end. Because if I lose you at the beginning, it's just going to get worse. All right. In terms of my background, when did I first hear about this, uh, this concept? HDR who uh, is the company that I work for, and we hold an, a biannual transportation conference. They get together about 1,000 professionals from across the country, uh, all based in transportation, all in civil. And we uh, basically talk about projects that we're working on, new concepts, new ideas, and things like that. And the Diverging Diamond Interchange came up as, as a portion of a presentation that was listed, Rare and Unusual Interchange Concepts. And at the time, I was working for the Oregon Bridge Delivery Partners. I am the lead traffic engineer for that program. And we had a location where this DDI was going to be a very, very nice fit. And at that point, the only other option that was on the table was an eight-lane wide standard diamond interchange. And ODOT simply couldn't stomach that cost. We looked at it from a diverging diamond perspective, and it only required a bridge. Instead of the bridge being eight lanes wide, the bridge for the DDI only, only needed to be three lanes wide. So that perked up a lot of eyes. Anyway, Green Springs Interchange, which you see behind you, what you see is a screen capture of the VISIM model, the micro simulation model we ran to produce uh, the traffic operations results at that particular interchange. And that's what yielded that three lane, um, three lane configuration. You can see here what's a little odd about it is the fact that you have two lanes going in the eastbound direction, you only have one lane coming in the westbound direction. For those of you who are familiar with the area, you know that a lot of the traffic is to the west, where the city of Ashland is, and to the north. Because to the south and to the east of here, there's absolutely nothing. So this actually, this concept actually very, very, uh, it's very efficient in handling high volumes of turning traffic. Anyway, we pitched the idea to, to, the, uh, to the Oregon Department of Transportation. And eventually, when we got buy-off from them, they had us go down. They had us talk to the county. They had us talk to the city. They had us talk to AAA. They had us talk to the Oregon Trucking Association. And we got buy-off across the board. But in the end, that particular project is no longer being considered for a diverging diamond because it turns out the bridge does not need to be replaced. It only needs to be repaired. So we're going with a completely different configuration there. But all the groundwork that we laid for that particular project <laughs> convinced enough people, bless you, to actually implement this at the Fern Valley Interchange, which is exit 24 on I-5. This project is currently under design, in design as a diverging diamond interchange, and it should go into construction in 2010 with completion in either late 2011 or mid-2012. And that will be the first diverging diamond built in the state of Oregon, and basically it'll be the first one built west of the Rockies. Originally, we were trying to push for that one to be the first one in the ground altogether in North America, it didn't quite work out. Lately, I just finished wrapping up this project about a month ago. I was actually on the team 
uh, for the Utah Department of Transportation that helped write their diverging diamond design guidelines. And that was because diverging diamonds have suddenly really become a hot item in a lot of places across the country. Anyway, what is a diverging diamond interchange? The screen that you see down in the bottom right corner is a, was actually a part of a three-dimensional simulation that was built by FHWA for a project in Missouri. This is a diverging diamond drive through in Kansas City, Missouri, I-435 and Front Street. What you see is a driver's perspective going all the way through this interchange. And you can see at that point where those two roads cross, the idea isn't that we allow the driver to think, hey, I'm on the right side or the wrong side or what have you. We want the driver to feel like they're on a one-way street that happens to intersect other one-way streets. Now, the other big key to the diverging diamond, and we'll show you this when uh, I pull up the schematic, and that is the fact that all of the turning movements onto and off of the ramps have been disconnected from the signals altogether. All the turning movements are free. In fact, if you look at this, you can see that there are still two traffic signals associated with the interchange, much like a standard diamond interchange. But in this case, the two signals are controlling the two crossing through movements. The through movements are highlighted in green and they're highlighted in red. And you can see on that schematic, this schematic, by the way, was, uh, was developed by the Missouri Department of Transportation and was published in the Kansas City Star as part of their public information, their public outreach for this particular project. But you can see there, highlighted in green and red, the actual through movements. And this, this schematic is designed to highlight the fact that they do cross over. So in the middle of the interchange, you are driving on the left side of oncoming traffic, which is a little bit unusual. Now, the question I often got was, how many of these actually exist? And to some people, the answer is one. And if the answer that you give is one, this is the one they usually point to. What you're, looking, what you're going to be looking at is an interchange in Versailles to the west of Paris. And the main reason you do not ever see this schematic as a, an example of what a diverging diamond interchange is or what it should look like is simply because that northern terminal is awfully scary looking. It's got five or six legs. None of this is signed and striped to anything resembling uh, an acceptable standard in the United States. Yes? No, there are not. In fact, the only thing in the median is actually just a raised curb barrier. And that's another, th that's another reason this is not looked at as a typical diverging diamond. Because if anybody were to say, I want to build that in your backyard, the answer would probably be absolutely not. And that is the reason that one is never shown as a typical. Now, one of the, uh, another one that they did build, and this is also in Paris. Uh, th this actually, I believe, is in Paris proper. We'll see here in a second. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that name. But this is just the eastern suburbs of Paris. This is a much more typical, if you can call it a typical layout, in the fact that all the, uh, the, the two terminals have four legs. And again, th as you pointed out, this is not a location where they actually had any kind of concrete barrier that would block the headlights of oncoming vehicles. The third one that exists, and this one does have a barrier in the middle, this one is the one that was most recently constructed. This is north east of Paris and this is near the Belgian border. This one actually has a little bit of a quirk to it as well in the fact that the eastbound left turning volume is so heavy that they actually broke the left turning volume, the, the left turning traffic off onto a separate structure. The left turn base starts back here and it actually comes across and crosses parallel with the eastbound through, comes through on its separate path altogether. And that's actually a configuration that we were very, very strongly looking at, incidentally, at Airport Way in 205. Now, another location that is never referenced, this one's on the M1. This is northeast of London in the UK. So bear in mind, when you're looking at this schematic, or when you're looking at this aerial photograph, traffic is flipped, so you're driving on the left side of the road. This is a three-legged, effectively it's a three-legged diverging diamond. If you bring these two legs into each other so they're much closer together, it's the same concept. It uses the same crossing movements. The catch to this one is it is completely unsignalized. There's only one piece of traffic control here, and it is a yield sign that's right there. So the only traffic that needs to actually come to a pause or has to yield the right-of-way is the exiting traffic as it comes off the freeway. It makes a pause right there and then comes all the way through. But again, the concept is the same. You're crossing the traffic over and trying to pull 
all the turning movements away from what generally speaking would be the ramp terminal. I was pointed out this example very, very recently. This is actually I-95 Thurber's Road, Providence, Rhode Island. This, this particular configuration has been in place for quite some time, but until now it really didn't have a name or anything associated with it because it doesn't look like anything that we would expect it to look like. Again, you have half of a diverging diamond here. The opposite side of the road, the east side of the road, all goes into a set of one-way streets, which is why the DDI wasn't fully completed on that particular side. But the concept, again, is still the same. A lot of the resistance to the diverging diamond interchange, not only do you drive on the opposite side of the road, but a lot of the resistance that we've encountered so far has to do with that crossing angle. People are afraid that if you're not crossing it perpendicular, I mean, if you're, do, if, you're, if you're in roadway design, the idea is you want to get those crossing movements to be as perpendicular as possible for line of sight and for other reasons. But in this case, the diverging diamond, obviously you're not going to reach that perpendicular angle. And a lot of people have had a lot of stress with how tight this angle could possibly be. This one, incidentally, is close to 18 degrees. <clears throat> now, where are they being considered? This one actually has grown probably doubled or tripled in size in the last six months. These are the ones that are no longer active for, whatever re for one reason or another. This one I already talked about. This one is due to a scope change in the bridge. A couple of those were associated with, uh, with planning studies that basically ran out of money and just kind of died out. I'm going to talk about a couple of these in particular later on. The California DOT, US 50 and Cameron Park Road, I will talk about that a little bit later, as well as the New Mexico DOT project at San Mateo Boulevard. Two that I will talk about right now, uh, let's see here, Finley, Ohio should be on here somewhere. Third one from the top, I-75 and US 224. That was the first location ever proposed in the United States. It was bought off on completely from a technical basis. In fact, the public bought off on it. Everything was ready to go. Newspaper articles had already been written about it. What happened was it went up to the director of the DOT. He said, there's no way I'm going to be your guinea pig over my dead body. So that project was shut down. This ended up being constructed as an eight-lane wide standard diamond interchange. The DDI would have been less, it would have been four lanes. Now, incidentally, you'll see that Ohio DOT shows up again. That was because the governorship changed from Republican to Democrat, and the first thing he did was remove the director of the DOT and put, one, put a different one in his place, and lo and behold, it came up. And what he tried to do was to take the DDI concept and shove it into that project, which was already well underway. And it turns out that he put it, in that program, put it into that project a little bit too late. So that one got tossed out as well. These are the ones that are currently being proposed. And of the ones that you might be interested in, one, this one was the Utah DOT one, Pioneer Crossing. That is a design-build project that is likely to be constructed in 2010 or 2011. And that was the impetus behind the development of the Utah DOT desi uh, design guidelines for diverging diamond interchanges. I already spoke real briefly about the Oregon DOT site, I-5, exit 24. That one is indeed nearing the completion of design. It will go into construction shortly. Missouri DOT. This one was the one that was first proposed. The design is complete. They do not have the funding right now to start construction on that, so that one is currently on hold. Down here, this one is a new one. I-44 and Missouri 13, this is just outside of Springfield, Missouri. This one has already started construction. This, they actually started construction on this about three weeks ago. It should be complete before the end of construction season this year. So when that does get built, I can guarantee you there are going to be a lot of people looking at that one to see what the operational benefits really are because this is our first chance in North America using the design guidelines that have kind of roughly been developed to see exactly how well it operates and whether or not there are any safety issues. Also on here, this project just went out for RFP. In fact, um, HDR actually bid on that. We haven't heard back yet. I-270 and Roberts Road, Ohio DOT is dead set on, on building a DDI sometime in the very near future, and that is their third attempt. Okay, in terms of proposed DDI locations, I'm going to bring up the following slide just to give you an idea where they're being proposed. This one is the Kansas City DDI. This one is I-435 and Front Street, and you can, what, what I want you to see here is primarily the fact that there is absolutely zero residential traffic whatsoever here. 
This is a heavily industrialized area. If it's not industrial park, it's office park. So these have massive, massive peak hour volumes and very little in the off-peak. What's more important about that particular design is the fact that all the dual turn lanes actually will accommodate side-by-side -side full tractor trailers, full design vehicles, WB67s. Down here, this is the one we are about to build in the state of Oregon. That's exit 24, Fern Valley Road. And this one is much more of a rural design. It's wide open. It's only going to be four-lane structure. This one over here at Front Street, they were originally looking at a, potentially an eight-lane wide standard diamond interchange. Now they're going with a four-lane DDI. Now, as a comparison, the mainline volumes on I-435 of the Front Street interchange, 125,000 vehicles per day. The crossroad is at 72,000 vehicles per day. On the other hand, you look at I-5 down here, the ADT on I-5 through that interchange is only in the neighborhood of about 35,000. So they're looking at this in heavily urbanized areas, as well as areas that aren't as developed, that aren't as saturated, aren't as near capacity. Now in terms of site choice, the question I've been getting a lot is, does the climate of a location preclude the use of a diverging diamond anywhere? If you looked at the previous screen, the ones where they're currently being looked at, you're looking at things like Salt Lake City, like Rochester, New York. You're looking at places like Arizona. You're looking at places like Florida, like Missouri. All sorts of different climates, yes and no to snow conditions, yes and no to ice conditions. So far, it has not been um, proven one way or another whether or not climates should preclude it. But if you look at the areas that have already been built, in particular in France and in the UK, it does not appear that snow and ice will be that big a deal. The question came up. Well, what happens if you have a diverging diamond interchange, and this one in particular was in Salt Lake City, and you're in the middle of a snowstorm, and they haven't gotten around to plowing the roads yet? You can't see the lane lines. How bad is it going to be for a driver to navigate a completely unfamiliar interchange concept if they don't have the road markings on the, on the pavement to, to guide them? And my answer to that question was very, was very simply this. Are you guys familiar with single point urban interchange? I know there aren't that many in the Portland metro area. Yeah, no, 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 sort of. There are a couple on the Vancouver, Washington side. Basically, it's an interchange concept where everything is brought into a single signal. If you guys have been down on I-5 in Salem, there's one at Market Street. Utah uses a lot of them. There are a lot of them in Chicago, a lot of different places. But the key thing about that interchange is the center piece where the signals are you could almost, in, this, in the state of Illinois anyway, you could almost drop a full football field in, in the area that's bounded by the stop bars. If that gets snowed on, you're looking at a massive piece of pavement. There's no raised barrier whatsoever. All you're looking at is barrier curb. You get a four-inch snowfall, you can't see a thing. My argument is, you look at the diverging diamond, there's a lot of positive guidance. You have a lot of concrete barrier that'll be guiding you. You have a lot of reflectors that are up sitting up on top of the glare shields and things like that. It'll be much easier to navigate a DDI than it would be a single point. One way or another, we're going to find out when that Springfield one gets built. Next one, is it better for the crossroad to go over or under the main line? So far as we've seen, nobody seems to care one way or another. One of the things that has been brought up, this was brought up by Missouri, this was brought up by Kansas, and this was brought up by Florida, as well as Oregon, actually. The only thing that would really preclude the use of a diverging diamond at an overcrossing or undercrossing would be maintaining sight distance. You want to make sure that your vertical geometry is such that you maintain sight distance as much as possible. Now, this question, the answer to this question has actually changed in the last two months. Are there existing design standards for diverging diamond interchanges? Previous to the last two months, I would have said no. Missouri's got a set of, Missouri's got a white paper, Oregon's got a white paper, a number of different people have proposed a couple of bullet points here and there. But now you have the state of Utah actually going ahead and publishing their design guidelines for diverging diamond interchanges, and that should be published sometime in the next four to six weeks. Incidentally, as being, being part of that team that helped write those standards, those standards were written by committee. And if anybody has ever tried to write a paper where you have four or five or six, in this case, 12 different people trying to assert their own opinions in on one paper, the result is something that in almost every case, not everybody's going to be happy with. Everybody who actually wrote the paper has some serious issues with parts of it. And those issues that will come up in this, uh, in this presentation, I'll mention those as we go. 
This is actually one of those locations. What is the design speed of the reverse curves in the crossroad through movement? Each one of those crossing movements, when they cross over, have reverse curves on both sides of that crossover. Question is, what's the design speed? Well, State of Utah actually wants to use the diverging diamond interchange, and they put this in quotes in their design guideline. They want to use this as a traffic calming device. On the other hand, you have Missouri and Oregon specifically saying they do not want this used as a traffic calming device. I side on the side of Missouri and Oregon. I think, it's, I think you should maintain the highest design speed possible, but that's just me. The design speed, incidentally, uh, Ohio, sorry, um, Utah went with a 20 mile an hour minimum, which I agree with, and a 25 mile an hour prefer preference but they want you to lower the design speed to 10 miles an hour beneath the posted speed limit of the approaches. That is, uh, they've actually mandated a 10 mile an hour reduction below the posted on the approaches, which is kind of asking for trouble in my, in my opinion, but that's that. In the terms of all the other states, basically the higher the design speed you can get, the better. If you can match the existing approaches, great. The thing of it is, the higher speed you have on those designs, the bigger the, that reverse curve footprint gets. The, the bigger that footprint gets, the more right away you're going to take. And a lot of places where these DDIs are being considered, they're trying to retrofit them into as small a space as possible. So people are putting these in places where they're, they're reducing the design speed because they have to. In Utah, they're taking a different approach. They're reducing the design speed because they want to, which is a little strange. Anyway, what is the optimum intersection angle of the crossroad through movements? When they say the intersection angle, they mean, this is looking at the left terminal, they mean what's the angle of that crossing movement between the two throughs. State of Utah wants a desirable 40 degrees. They want an absolute minimum of 30, which is interesting because the, uh, the widest one that's been built to date is sitting at about 25 degrees. So in essence, they're saying all the current designs and everything that's actually been put in the ground are all substandard. Recall the one that I talked about in Providence, Rhode Island, that's sitting at 18 degrees. The ones that we've designed here in the state of Oregon are sitting between 18 and 23 degrees. State of Oregon is saying 20, 20 degree minimum, 25 degree preferable. Utah is taking the 40 degree, 40 degree preferable, 30 degree minimum. Yes? Was the design on the Utah done, um, I guess, in-house or was it given out to a consultant? The Utah DOT project is only the second one that is going to be designed outside of an agency. That one was recommended by the design builder, so that one is being designed by a consultant. The first one that was ever designed by a non-agency was I-90 and Beck Road, which was designed by HDR, and I helped out on that design. To date, everything else has been designed in-house by the DOT because the DOTs have wanted to use their first evers as the template, as a trial and error basis to establish their design criteria. Yes? How did you determine what the optimum angle would be for this kind of intersection? The optimum angle, in, in theory, the optimum angle is 90. Granted, you're never going to get there. Uh, most people have been saying that the optimum angle should be 45. Really, really the feeling is among those who have actually tried to lay one out, the optimum angle is as, as, high, as close to 90 as you can get it feasibly. And realistically speaking, the only reason they put a 45 or a 40 degree number out there was simply because of the recognition that you're trying to fit this into as small a cross section as possible. In terms of establishing the minimum, that more often than not came down to a political decision with the roadway engineers of the, of the state agencies. They, for the most part, they took a look at what their narrowest or what their most acute angle of intersection was at a functioning intersection within that state, and they used that as their absolute minimum. Does that answer your question? Cool. Yeah. So I'm looking up here at your diagram. How are bikes and pedestrians supposed to navigate through this? It looks a little bit terrifying if I'm on a bike. Excellent. And I'm going to defer that answer until later because that's actually one of the later frequently asked questions. If I don't cover it to your satisfaction, then let me know. Yes? I, when I've done my travels, I've come across intersections that look a lot like these, but where you have the lighted, the signaled intersections, I've seen roundabouts, small rotaries, small roundabouts. 
And I've seen them in color, uh, excuse me, in Madison, Wisconsin. They have an intersection that's something like this, but again with small roundabouts. And then also in Siena, Italy. Okay, um, I can definitely see the one in Italy. And I'd, if you could actually point out where exactly that one is, I'd like to find it on Google Earth. But in terms of why we're not considering roundabouts at the crossing intersections here, a lot of that has to do with, with, with simply the fact that whatever platoon gets there first is going to override everything else. If you look at this and you convert it into a roundabout traveling around the right side, the vehicles that are going in that direction will come across the approach to this side. So basically, which, if, that, if the platoon approaching from the left gets there first, it will completely shut out what's coming from the right. That the same is not true vice versa, but the main reason we haven't been looking at roundabouts at, a look at, at diverging diamonds like this, if you can picture what a roundabout would look like fit in there, you'd end up exploding out the footprint of each one of those ramp terminals. And that kind of goes counterintuitive to what they're trying to do with these DDIs. We have looked at, um, we have looked at the operations as well as a comparative uh, analysis of the footprint of what a standard diamond with roundabout terminals would look like compared to a diverging diamond. And if you end up requiring dual lanes going around the circulatory roadway of the roundabout, the roundabout foot footprint becomes much more massive than the diverging diamond. Good question so far. Um, Utah DOT wanted to ask the question, what additional striping did Missouri actually do? Now, I showed you the drive-through before. This is actually a screen capture of that 3D model. Not only did they do that drive-through, they actually built a three-dimensional model of the diverging diamond, and they, they built it into a driving simulator. They took focus groups, put them behind the wheel of a car, and drove them through that model. They drove them through that model to test different implementations of signing, striping, and glare shield placement. And incidentally, the movement that everybody worried about, everybody typically says, well, you're going to have wrong way crashes right here. You're going to have people coming through this intersection and trying to go that way. That was the main worry. That's often the main worry of people when they see this concept for the first time. Incidentally, when they ran that focus group, there was only one driver that made a mistake. And that driver made that the same mistake over and over and over. It didn't matter what the signing was. It didn't matter what the striping was. The mistake was made repeatedly. And that mistake actually takes some doing. The driver went through this intersection and hung a hard left at that next one to go back in the other direction, which given the layout that she was driving on, there I said it was a she, was a 145 degree turn. Incidentally, the person that did it was an 80 year old woman. And she made that mistake over and over and over. And she, incidentally, she was not the only elderly woman that was in the focus group, but she was the only one who actually repeatedly made that mistake. They threw her out as an outlier. I would have been curious to see if we continued to drive her through the network, what other, what other things she would do. But anyway, in terms of additional striping, the gist of it is this. For those of you who are not fami intimately familiar with the MUTCD, they added in these, these arrows here on the approach. They added in the arrows on the back side and they added the, um, the, skip do, um, the skip dash going through the intersection, which you, which you do see on some other intersections, mostly single points or things that involve a kink or a curve or something like that. But in general, those are the only pieces of striping they added. In terms of signing, you'll notice that there is a do not enter sign here, a keep left sign here, and they actually put those two directional arrows on the mast arm over each lane. That is the only additional signing that was actually required at the intersections. Now one of the things that you can't really see very well on this because the glare shield is green and it's sitting on green grass, they put a glare shield up here and along that side. Now the question is, you put that glare shield in, what are you trying to protect? You're trying to protect the view of these, ve uh, the headlights of these vehicles down here from getting into the eyes of those vehicles up there. So my question was, why'd you put two of them? Because if the light doesn't get through this, it's sure not going to get through that. So as part of the Utah guidelines, we only put, we only implemented either do them to the inside or do them to the outside. You don't need both. The other thing we implemented with the Utah desi uh, design guidelines was to cut these short over here because once the vehicles have started to make that turn, their headlights are aimed over here. It's no longer an issue of it getting in to the eyes of the oncoming drivers. The other thing is because Missouri is actually going with glare shields all the way up to the edge, what happens if the signal is functioning but there's somebody on the opposite side that's going to run that red light. There's no way for you to know. What happens if the power goes out? 
and you go to full stop, stop sign control, you have zero sight distance. So those are things that we, that we fixed, that we made sure were implemented in the Utah uh, DOT design guidelines. In terms of right-of-way, footprint and cost compared to other diamond interchanges, that very largely depends on how high speed a diverging diamond you intend to build. For the most part, what you're going to find is on the bridge itself or through the interchange itself, it's going to be narrower. On the approaches, it's going to be a little bit wider because those reverse curves require you to bow out to open up the median before you cross traffic over. So instead of looking at sliver cuts, you're looking at more of an hourglass type shape to the right of way. Um, however, there is one major benefit that uh, we didn't really realize would be there until we designed the one in Idaho, until we looked at the one in Utah. Do you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I know you mentioned about whether it doesn't matter whether the diverging diamond would go underneath the, the um, over or under. Over yeah. or under. But if it went under, then you would get some benefit from already having a, like some kind of concrete median there for like bridge pillars or. Something. Yes, you would to some degree. But what you're looking at in between that most people are looking at is a jersey barrier uh, with glare shield mounted on the top of that. And more often than not, if you're over or under, generally speaking, you don't really have anything more than a barrier median. Unless you're looking at a single point. In some cases, they put a jersey barrier in the middle there, but it's not really necessary. It does help you in terms of construction staging. But uh, in terms of the over or under, it's, it's a toss-up. It depends on the site specifics. And that's the really cool thing about designing these, these interchanges is that not only do you, you don't have any standards really to follow. When we tried to write them, we realized very quickly that you can't really write them for this as detailed as you can for other concepts. So much of it depends on you actually not just knowing the standard, but knowing the intent behind the standard. So it's, uh, there's a lot more give and take there than there is for the design of other interchanges. Yeah? Um, Button. They would for the movements that are directly beneath, but for the most part, those are only the, the movements peeling off and coming on, the on-ramp turns, basically. The, the actual crossing intersections, the points where the through movements cross, those are going to be away from the center of the, uh, the freeway, one way or another, uh, anyway. It's, those, those terminals are separated more like they are in a standard diamond or a tight diamond as opposed to being in the center like they are for a single point. Okay? All right, where was I? Oh. Uh, footprint. One of the things that you can do with this, if you've ever, d well, I, I guess I already asked that question. When you intend to design an interchange, you want the crossroad to cross the freeway as perpendicular as possible. The, the more oblique, or the more um, off of perpendicular that angle happens to be, number one, your structure costs go up. Number two, you start running into issues with sight distance at your ramp terminals. So in general, when you're designing interchanges, you want those crossroads to come across at 90 degrees or somewhere in probably no more than 70. What that usually means when you're designing a freeway, uh, are you gonna, guys going to be able to hit the chalkboard if I draw something on there? Well, we'll find out. Anyway, if you have a situation where the roadway typically crosses like that and that's your freeway, one of the things that we found that you have to do in order to make this more of a 90 degree angle is you end up having to realign significant portions of the roadway. And you end up taking a lot of right-of-way up there and up there. One of the things, one of the nice quirks about the diverging diamond is, and we discovered this at Beck Road, is you do not have to realign all that roadway. You can actually come in much more like this. Because there are reverse curves that the through movements are going through anyway, those reverse curves, if you just extend them coming off the back, you can actually tie the crossroad in much, much tighter than you otherwise would. And that was the sole reason the DDI came up at Pioneer Crossing on I-15 in Utah. How does the DDI impact access control on the crossroad? Well, I guess since uh, you guys aren't roadway designers, the definition of access control, when you have an interchange, you need to restrict all the access points, driveways, other cross streets, minor cross streets, and things like that, from coming in too close to the interchange. So how does a DDI differ in terms of access control? If anything, it makes them more stringent. 
because all of your access points near the interchange now have to be right in, right out because you have a barrier and an extra wide median coming through those sections. In terms of safety, and this is where we're going to get bike and ped stuff in a little bit, is it actually safer or is it a safety risk? So far, nobody's been able to tell. I can tell you that there's been one study that was performed on the Versailles DDI. They looked at five, di they looked at five years of accident data, and they compared that data to... Okay? And they compared that data from that location to an equivalent single, uh, to a, an equivalent standard diamond interchange in the United States. They, com they made sure to compare sites that had similar volumes, similar, similar turning movement volumes, and similar through volumes, things like that. And they discovered that after five years, the Versailles interchange only had 11 property damage uh, accidents only, nothing else. If you compare that to the accident rate, to a similar type of situation, similar location type, similar volume types in the United States that represents a reduction in accident rate of about 48 percent. Now with that in mind, we don't have any accident history in North America. We don't have any accident history outside of France. So what can we look at to see whether or not it is actually going to be a safety improvement or a safety risk? And for that, we're going to look at conflict points. How many people have actually seen a conflict point diagram before? Most of you? Okay, for those who've, who have not, basically all those dots are areas where your one intended path crosses another intended path, one way or another. So coming through this intersection, you're going to cross the opposing through, the opposing, well, sorry, the through from the left, the opposing left, things like that. So every point where you intersect with somebody else's intended movement, you have a conflict point. Now I've given you a blow up of the left terminal of the terminal on the left side of a standard diamond. This is, I'm going to blow up the left side of a diverging diamond as well. So we're going to be looking primarily at this side. So, looking at both of these two points, look at the number of conflict points that you have in the diverging diamond. Let's look at the eastbound through. The eastbound through intersects with those three movements. One, two, three, sorry, those four movements. The eastbound through in the diverging diamond intersects with one. At every point in a diverging diamond interchange where you have a conflict, you are only conflicting against one other movement coming from one other direction. That's it. Likewise, coming off of the ramp on the DDI, the only opposing movement is the, oncoming, is the uh, eastbound through. If you look at the full diagram of the interchange, you look at the one on the right for the standard diamond, look at the conflict diagram on the left for the diverging diamond. And if you were to count those points, you end up seeing that you have about a 50% reduction in the number of conflict points at the interchange, simply through the geometric layout. Now, how, how are we going to accommodate bicycles and pedestrians? This is a question you asked earlier, right? And I'm going to use the same diagram except without the angles. State of Oregon, this is actually coming out of a uh, paper developed by the Oregon DOT by Dave Warwick. With the, he's the state interchange engineer. After much deliberation, we decided to keep them on the right side of the rightmost through lane. So they will travel through this interchange as if they're traveling on the right side of a one-way street, which happens to mean that when you're in the middle, you're basically, you have your travel lanes, your bike lane going in that direction, you'll have a shoulder, you'll have the barrier. On the other side of the barrier, you're going to have the opposing bike lane and then the opposing through lanes. That's what the cross-section looks like. Incidentally, one of the things that has been considered was putting a barrier here and a barrier here and putting the bikes dead, dead center in a completely protected zone. The opposition to that has been, how do you tell the bikes to drive on the left side when they're right next to the other side? So. One thing at a time, they said. Just put the barrier in the middle and let the bike lanes travel on uh, adjacent to the through lanes. Now, in terms of pedestrians, this is a schematic of the Fern Valley interchange. All the areas in pink are where the cross are where the crosswalks are at this interchange. What that means is, every time you cross a ramp, instead of cross, crossing it at one crosswalk, you're now crossing at two. However, those crossing movements are crossing a much narrower area. Imagine how large this area has to be if you're crossing at a standard diamond. Because that diamond, the radius return for that diamond has to account for all the truck movements. 
So basically, instead of having a throat where you're crossing something very simple like this, you're crossing a ramp here, and then you're crossing a ramp here, if you were to do this at a standard diamond interchange, your radius return looks like this, and this curb right here has to be designed to accommodate a, a WB67, or a full-size truck making that turn. This over here has to be designed so it accommodates the truck turning right. Oftentimes, this crosswalk right through there tends to get upwards of 30 feet. And if it's a dual turn lane, that crosswalk can get up to about 40 feet. On the other hand, if you're crossing movements like that, your widest crossing for a single lane is probably closer to about 18 feet. And for a dual turn lane, it's probably closer to 30. And to top it off, each one of those movements is protected, which I will get to. The question came up, can you have vehicles cross along with the ramp? Can you actually have them cross the cross, ro uh, cross the cross road at the interchange? And you can see here, this is the layout, the second one I showed you from France. They actually do have that movement where it crosses adjacent or parallel to the, uh, the freeway. It can be done. I can tell you that none of the DOTs I've spoken to like this idea. What they want to do is that what all the designs to date have shown is they're going to take those pedestrian crossings and move them to the nearest signal and cross them there. In this particular case, they didn't do that here because the southwestern quadrant not only is a freeway on-ramp, but it turns into basically a frontage road with residential traffic. Now, in blue, and that appears to be a poor color choice, as was the brown, in blue are all the vehicular movements that will be going on during one phase of the signal cycle. In brown are all the, all the locations where the pedestrians can cross without the interference of any traffic because that traffic is being signalized. So every single crossing the pedestrian has to make is actually protected by a signal. This is the second phase. Vehicles going in red and the pedestrians going in blue. Again, every crossing can be completely protected by a signal. Now, from an operational standpoint, should you signalize every movement on a DDI? Realize this, that if you do signalize everything, you're not adding any additional phases to your signals because everything can go and still make it a two-phase signal. Now, the answer has come up, signalize it if you have significant pedestrian volumes. Signalize it if you have very high traffic volumes. And at that point, you're signalizing it not for the pedestrians, but more for the traffic flow. And signalize always when you have more than one lane on your turning roadway. This is the actual engineering schematic from the Kansas City DDI. And when I say more than one, one lane on a turning roadway, this off-ramp has dual left. This off-ramp actually has a dual left and a dual right. There's an, uh, the Utah DDI actually had three lanes going off in this direction, even though all the, la the ramps were single lane. They had two through coming in through here. They had basically an add lane coming in through here and then turning off. Well, they were encountering weaving problems. And my argument to them was, well, if you signalize a movement, you take away your weaving problem. And that's, in the end, what they decided to do at Pioneer Crossing. Next, how much does DDI actually improve the capacity of the interchange, and what is the actual capacity of a DDI? This comes from a paper done by FHWA. They showed a, a 15 to 20% increase in capacity and a 60% decrease in delay. Is that actually the case? Well, it depends very largely on how your traffic is distributed. A DDI works best when you have really heavy turning movements. And it, and it operates more poorly, or it doesn't show as substantial a benefit when you have really high through volumes. So depending on what volume scenario they looked at, you'd end up with a different answer. In some cases, it'll be much higher uh, percent increase in capacity. Yes? And just to clarify for me, um, <clears throat> this is with less lanes, less construction, you're, you're increasing capacity, limiting delay without building 20 lanes. That's an excellent point. That is with the similar lane configuration, a similar number of lanes. I did a paper for uh, the ITE technical conference last year in Anaheim. 
and we looked at the operational characteristics of a DDI compared to other interchanges. And the first thing we hit was, well, it doesn't make sense to compare a four-lane DDI with a four-lane diamond. Because if you're going to go into a project, you're not going to build something that fails. You're going to go in and build, if you, if, you've a, if you have your heart set on a standard diamond, you're going to put as many lanes in there as it takes to make it work. If you're going to build a diverging diamond, you're not going to put more lanes out there than you really need. So that paper, which uh, if anybody's interested, I can get you the link and send you the, uh, send you the paper itself. That paper actually compared the operational benefits, but also factored it into how many lane miles you actually would need to put down in order to make each one meet a target level of service. So it's, it's kind of, I, I hate to use these statistics because you, what you build for one concept is not going to be equivalent to what you build for another. Now, at the interchanges that I've actually worked on from an operational comparison, I will say that the standard diamond interchange here was eight lanes wide. It required eight lanes on the bridge. The diverging diamond required three, just to give you an idea how much of a benefit that was. At Pleasant View, we had an eight-lane diamond versus a four-lane diverging diamond. And you can see the numbers there yourself. Again, we pitched the DDI at these locations because it was more tailored to how heavy, how much turning movement we had, how much turning volume we had. Had, though, had there been a lot more through traffic at either one of those interchanges, you wouldn't see that kind of disparity. By all means, you wouldn't see that 90 to, 90 to 11, because that's about, a 90%, about an 88% reduction in your delay. And you're not going to see that everywhere. Now, in terms of when shouldn't a DDI be used, this is site-specific. It's extremely site-specific. Everything about a DDI is site-specific, which is why they're fun to work with. But the ones that everybody seems to agree on, and this is one that I actually don't agree on, don't use them when you have high-speed crossroad approaches. That's one that's, stip that's stipulated by Oregon and it's stipulated by Ohio. Utah disagrees. And I disagree because, I'm going I'm to tell you this, if you have high-speed crossroad approaches, you can still build a DDI, but your reverse curves have to be built to a higher design speed. In some cases, that design speed may be such that your, your profile, your, your footprint of the interchange, becomes so big it's no longer practical. So just realize you can build them at higher speed, they're just going to take up a lot more space. This is one I wholeheartedly agree with. Do not build them where you have nearby high volume intersections along the crossroad, and I will show you an example of that. This is a DDI that was pitched in, Cal in Cameron Park, California, and this was pitched to Caltrans. It did not fly. One of the reasons I've given this presentation is because, yes, the DDI is kind of cool. It's kind of different, but it should be considered alongside with other interchanges. It shouldn't be considered as something new and something strange, but don't go taking it as the silver bullet. It's not going to solve every problem, and don't try shoving it in places where it really shouldn't belong. And this is one of those places. 250 feet away, you have an intersection with a dual left turn. You can't get out of your reverse curvature before you need to open up the turn bay. It was never going to fit. This is an area where they should have looked at the aerial photograph and said, it ain't going to work. Now, horizontal curvature. This is not necessarily a no-no, but this is, an this is one of those locations where the DDI was looked at and thrown out for good reason, because it was going to, frankly, be more effort than it was really worth. This is I-40 and San Mateo Boulevard. This is just east of downtown Albuquerque. The existing alignment of the crossroad is already on a reverse curve. So now the designer is being asked to, to weave, to interlace, dual reversing curves on top of a reverse curve. That is an absolute nightmare. What they ended up resulting in was actually having the DDI become a one-way couplet on the north side. And it ended up wiping out significant amounts of development. Wasn't worth the effort. So that ended up being a single point. This one ties back to the over or under. When you shouldn't you use it? You shouldn't use it if, you're, if you can't do anything to fix the vertical profile. And the vertical profile is a significant impediment to, to sight distance, be it decision sight distance or stopping sight distance. With that, does anybody have any questions? It's either stunned silence or, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have a question uh, about, I, I guess maybe from the simulation. Do the, uh, 
does the DDI tend to decrease platooning onto the freeway? You know, you are the first person who has ever asked that question. And the answer is absolutely. In fact, one of the, one of the items that, that was in the paper that I did at Anaheim was specifically to point out that if your freeway is at or near capacity, putting a DDI in instead of a single point, instead of a standard diamond, instead of all the other, all the other types you could put in there, and because of the nature of the diverging diamond, because you clear one signal here, and then the, uh, the entry pattern onto the freeway is much more spread out, you actually improve operations at the merge point on the freeway as well. For those of you who don't follow what we're talking about, if this was a standard diamond, this would probably be a dual left turn going eastbound left, going eastbound to northbound. That would stack up with roughly 300 feet times two lanes. You're looking at 600 linear feet of traffic. When this light turns green, all that traffic hits the freeway at the same time. And under similar volumes, similar conditions, as one example, we had, we had um, we, we, what we looked at were the speeds at the merge point and then 1,000 feet upstream of the merge point. And the DDI showed about an eight, eight, uh, eight mile an hour reduction in the, in the actual running speed on the freeway in the right lane, whereas a single point showed about a 15 mile an hour reduction and a standard diamond was sitting at almost a 30 mile an hour reduction. Keep in mind that was at very, very high volume, but it makes a substantial difference. That's a great question. Yeah. That really depends on what you're doing, what the angle is, and is very site specific. I can tell you that in Missouri for the Front Street one, you were looking at 37 million for the standard diamond interchange, mainly because they were trying to retrofit this underneath an existing structure without hitting the structure. So to provide the extra lanes for the standard diamond, they were going to dig out behind the abutment and actually extend the bridge that way. So that one was going to cost 37 million. They went with the DDI because it cost 7.5. I'm not sure if I follow the traffic flow here too well, but is there any problems with queuing on the reverse lanes there? Queuing back this well, way? Like with the standard diamond, you know, you oftentimes have queues go back through the previous uh, intersection, like for that left turn lane or something like that. Is that a problem at all with this? The left turn lane's free, so no. Uh, basically, if there were any problems, if you noticed this signal queuing back into this one, basically you just got to play with your signal timing to make sure you're not backing traffic up from one signal through the other intersection. But that becomes a timing issue, and that's why I said these operate much better when you have higher turning volumes than you do higher through volumes. Because when you have higher through volumes, you increase the likelihood of this traffic, back, that through traffic backing up from that signal through the previous intersection. Yeah? Um, I was wondering if, I don't, I don't know if you have this sort of information from the, these sort of interchanges that have already been built. Um, do they experience, or do you expect them to experience, a certain amount of time um, for people to get used to them as far as them operating how, you, how they're supposed to? That remains to be seen. We'll see when the Springfield, Missouri one goes out. Uh, but they're doing the same type of thing that they did for roundabouts for this, meaning a massive public information, a massive public education program beforehand. But um, all that testing that they did with the focus groups, was primarily to get people to see if they'd follow, where, to be where they needed to be without warning them in advance, hey, you're driving into something different. And the anticipation is that properly designed, people will feel like they're just on a one-way street. So we hope that the answer is no, that there won't be some sort of reaction time. The only place where I think you might actually see some sort of um, some sort of issue with drivers needing to get used to it is simply the fact that this turn over here becomes free flow and we're not used to a free flow left turn so much as we are used to a free flow right going into a loop ramp for example or something like that but I think that's a question that'll be best answered in about 12 months we'll have something more concrete for you but I can tell you every place it's been discussed it has been all over the news it's been all over the headlines and newspapers and things like that and the hits on the websites that MoDOT or that Ohio DOT have been putting out for these new interchanges have been getting pretty good traffic. So, any other questions? Yes? It affects it very poorly, but thank you for asking that question. One of the questions that we did receive 
was what happens when you have a disabled vehicle. And to that end, we've made sure that on the interior of the interchange, we've provided wide enough shoulders to accommodate at least one disabled vehicle. So you have at least 10 feet on the inside shoulder of both directions. In some cases, that may mean taking out the bike lane temporarily while that traffic, while that traffic is at a dead standstill. But that is one of the things that been, that's been discussed. And that goes hand in hand, actually, with areas where we've had a lot of snow or it's being proposed where there's a lot of snow. The question was, where are we going to store the snow? And in Utah, for example, they're not anticipating high bicycle traffic, but they're still putting in the bike lane because that provides them eight extra feet of snow storage when they actually get snow. And that storage is hopefully where the disabled vehicle will go. <laughs> Good question, though. Yeah? I do have a question going back to the bicycles. Um, the, on, the incoming traffic from the freeway, them turning right and yielding into the lanes, wouldn't, couldn't that possibly, because then the bicycle has to go across that. You're talking this movement interfering and the bicycle's going through, yes. correct? Yes. That ties back to whether or not you should signalize every movement. Because that's a dual movement, that will most definitely get signalized. The areas where we've seen this movement come in free, it's always been a design more like this where it's a wider flare coming in. And yeah, there'll probably still be that conflict point, but the areas where we're having significant bicycle traffic, they are actually making a point of signalizing the right turn. Yes? Is the three to four lane fairly standard for these, or has it been looked at making them larger? One of the sites in Utah, they're actually looking at three through lanes in each direction, as well as dual and triple lefts and rights. So the widest one I've seen so far is six lanes. That's not to say you couldn't build them any higher, but the fear is if you're actually looking at four plus through lanes in each direction, number one, should you be looking at a system-to-system -system interchange instead? Number two, do you have so much through movement that you shouldn't be, that one of these won't function anyway? Question in the back? Um, <laughs> I wasn't clear when you were citing that FHWA study. Um, were those um, differences versus a standard diamond? Those were differences based on the DDI in Versailles against a standard diamond in a similar suburban location with similar volumes in the United States as an average. Okay, before we thank our speaker, and we should especially thank him for coming just one day after returning apparently from his honeymoon, am I correct? So uh, we'll three days, but okay. returning from Thailand, yes. Okay. We'll congratulate you in just a second, but I did want to mention that next week we have Bob DeConing from Routeware. He'll be speaking about 21st century smart truck and smart back office technologies. So let's thank Smith for his great presentation.